Greg, right before we started recording last week, you told me, well, you know, we've got some thunderstorms expected in the area, and boy, did you. That was, those are some impressive storms that rolled through last Saturday. First lightning hit at 714, and the last lightning strike was in the seven-mile radius of the stadium. It went off at 338 yeah. in the morning. Yeah. So you're talking about eight, nine hours of just almost constant lightning around the area. And that's really odd. Even Scott Frost said that. Monday at his press conference, he said, you know, going up in here, usually you have a front that comes through, a mm-hmm. thunderstorm rolls through in about an hour, 90 minutes, and it passes on through the east, and you're in the clear. But this one just sat right on top of Lincoln and Lancaster County and just wouldn't move. And, you know, it was kind of predicted. And yeah. I, I think we, we all kind of, in fact, here at the network, we pre-plotted what we were going to do during delays on Friday. So we were, we were ready for it. It's just a shame because the – atmosphere around the stadium mm-hmm. was electric the pregame show and the tunnel walk got everybody all fired up and here comes the kickoff and then you see a guy will running out of the field waving his <laughs> arms and send everybody to their locker room <laughs> it's like it reminds me of you know watching a kid be handed a balloon at a carnival or yeah. something all of a sudden the air goes out and it just lifts him up in the air i was going to ask you because the people that did come the people that, that were there early enough Boy, I'll tell you what, that was a spectacle. I mean, that whole pregame show, that whole tunnel walk. I mean, if you didn't have goosebumps, whether you're a Nebraska fan or not, that was quite an event. Fantastic. The Unity Walk where the team arrives about two hours before kickoff, and they walk around the stadium and into the north side. I mean, there were thousands of people there that wanted to get a glimpse of this football team and get a glimpse of the new head coach for the Cornhuskers. And then they were all inside. I mean, a lot of times when – Teams start to warm up, you know, there's 15, 20,000 people in the stands. They're probably, were, it was half full when the teams came out to warm up. People <laughs> were so excited to see this team go. And I just feel bad for the folks that had to, to do all that driving and yeah. didn't get to see a game. And for the team and the coaches who were excited, how about this for this coaching staff? This is the third straight year they've been a part of a, a team that had a game canceled. Wow. They had two back to back years at UCF mm-hmm. because of hurricanes, and then this one here last Saturday. So if you had to put odds on it, are you doing a game October 27th, do you think? You know, I, I just don't know what to think. I mean, I, I know Akron, uh, I think, is really pushing hard to kind of lock in December the 1st if neither team makes their conference mm, okay. championship game because they'd like that big payday that yeah. the contract lays out for them. I think, you know, Nebraska would probably be okay with that, but I also think that, you know, they kind of want to just – you get to December the 1st, and if you don't make your conference – championship game you probably want to be out on the road recruiting and you probably want to be you know getting the team kind of some healed up for a bowl game um so i i don't know i think they're they're exploring all options the problem with the december 1st if you wait for that you might have to wait until early november to decide neither team is going to make yeah. their conference championship game so you're even kind of on hold for that a little bit so my guess is they're 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 making a lot of phone calls to people to see if they can lock in somebody for October 27th. I was going to ask you about the payout, and I know you're not in charge of that, but I just wanted to get your opinion because over in Ames, South Dakota State was playing Iowa State, and they got uh, canceled as well, though they got four minutes into the game before they got canceled, and the Jackrabbits did get the payout from Iowa State. Is it just is it a question of because they actually had some snaps and had some, some plays from scrimmage that that's the difference between the Jacks getting paid and the Zips not? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I know Nebraska said that they're going to certainly cover Akron expenses for flying here and mm-hmm. hotel space and all those things that they would have incurred by being here. It's probably the different language of different contracts sure. and how you put that. And so I, without seeing the two contracts side by side, I don't know what the difference would be. I would highly doubt that the fact that you played four minutes would make much of a difference. Yeah. But, you know, I'm, I'm not a lawyer. I watch oh, yeah. legal shows on television, <laughs> stuff, but I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> all right, let's talk about Colorado and what should be much better weather tomorrow afternoon at 2.30 in a game you can hear live right here on ESPN 99.1. Let's go back to the old Husker Buffalo days. And and people maybe forget, Colorado had replaced Oklahoma as Nebraska's main rival back in, in, in the, the final days of the Big 12 for the Huskers. Sure did, particularly when you when the conference split from the Big 8 to the Big 12. You weren't playing Oklahoma every year. You weren't playing Colorado every year. And Bill McCartney had done such a great job of building the Buffalo program up to being of national prominence there in the late 80s and early 90s, and that those games were huge. Yeah. Those games were for the Big A championship for a couple of years, and then they were for the Big North championship a couple of different times. Uh, it was really heated probably more so on the Colorado side than the Nebraska mm-hmm. side. Now, 
for the fans, Jeff, yeah, they certainly can recite the 91 or 92 game or the 2008 game when Alex Henry kicked the field goal or Colorado loves to point to the 2001 game where they really got the best of Nebraska in that game. But for the current players, most of them were like in grade school <laughs> yeah. the last time we played because yeah. it was 2010 right. the last time we played each other. So for the players on either side, they're like, okay, you're all telling me this is a big deal, but I don't know. So fans, yes, absolutely. Players, not so much because they just weren't old enough to really appreciate any of that. So Colorado beats Colorado State 45-13. You can argue about how good Colorado State is, but the fact of the matter is the Buffaloes have a game under their belt. The Cornhuskers do not. I think it's a huge advantage for them, and they played really well. Stephen Montez, yeah. the quarterback, is really good. So they got to iron out you know, some of their mistakes that you're going to make in week ones of games when Nebraska hasn't now. The other side of that, and there is certainly some advantage to not having tape of a team. So Colorado's a little blind about what, Nebraska may do with some of their personnel. They've, I'm sure, poured over the UCF tapes from last year to see what Scott Frost likes to do in certain situations and formations at certain down and distances, but they haven't seen it with Nebraska personnel on the field. So that's an advantage for Nebraska. So it may even out. I would rather be in the Colorado camp <laughs> than in the Nebraska camp having played a game. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of examples of teams that didn't play week one and came out and won in week two over somebody who had already played. And I can point to Colorado because Colorado State had played the week before mm-hmm. against Hawaii. So they had a game under their belt and CU didn't, and it didn't seem to bother Colorado last week. So you know, I think once you get halfway to the first quarter, all that's a moot point. Everybody's in settled in and ready to go. And speaking of the first quarter, boy, the Buffaloes come out hot. They scored touchdowns on four of their first five drives. And this is hard to believe, Greg, the first time in school history they had a 300-yard passer, 200-yard receiver, and 100-yard rusher all in the same game. How about that? Wow. I mean, almost 600 yards of offense. I really like Montez, the quarterback. I think this is like his 19th start. Mm-hmm. Uh, very good player. They run a, a hurry-up spread offense, which I think that that's fine. Nebraska sees that every day in practice. That, that'll be okay to be able to do that. Uh, but not, offensively, there are some weapons. Chenault, their wide receiver, had the great game. In the passing game for them last week, they've got a, a running back who's a, a senior transfer from Virginia Tech that went over the 100 yards for the Buffaloes. So they've got some weapons on that side of the ball. Um, and in so many ways, these two teams mirror each other, both coming off of disappointing seasons a year ago. Uh, they run similar style offense and defense. And really, both teams, the question marks, probably rely more on defense than offense. So it's like looking in the mirror a little bit when you look at Colorado. And a lot of high percentage passes, which is understandable when you consider that they were 122nd in terms of sacks allowed last year in the nation. And so when Montez goes 22 of 25, you realize they're not chucking it down the field a ton. That's right. They're picking their spots, getting the ball out in a hurry. And that's what Nebraska's offense will do as well. Uh, Eric Schneider, I'm sure, will really try to dial up some pressures in this game. Nebraska, I think, is going to have to bring some heat make Montez uncomfortable. 22 of 25, you kidding me? Yeah. I mean, that, that means the kid was totally in the zone, totally comfortable, totally relaxed. Nebraska can't let him be that way. They've got to disrupt him a little bit. And here, Jeff, and Brian have talked about this enough, this is where the home field advantage certainly should come in to help Nebraska. Make some noise. Make them have a hard time communicating a little bit. Make them slow down on offense where they have to maybe check to a different play and can't get the communication out to the wideouts. I think the 12th man is going to be a big factor in this game tomorrow for Nebraska. One of the keys will be which defense has greatly improved over last year. The Buffaloes 108th against the run last year. The Huskers 114th against the run last year. So stopping the running game is going to be key. Yeah, and again, both teams trying to figure out an identity on defense. And, you know, this Eric Chenander defense, you know, we talked about it a little bit last week. It's going to be very much a pressure-oriented defense. He's going to take chances. He's going to send different blitzes and different wrinkles. Now, that's going to result in some negative plays, hopefully results in a bunch of turnovers, but you're also susceptible to giving up big plays down the field. But maybe you make Colorado, instead of throwing those short little dumps or quick slants, make them have to throw it deeper downfield, and then that's where you maybe a safety slides over and gets a pick for you. So I, I think Nebraska will be extremely aggressive on defense and hope to make Montez make some mistakes. This is where it will help Colorado having a game. They've got some confidence on defense coming in. They forced nine punts, picked off a pass, had three sacks, and they've got their two leading tacklers back at, at linebacker in Gamboa and Lewis. 
Yeah, and, and then they had another kid who was the Pac-12 defensive player of the week. He had like 14 tackles for them a week ago. So I think they're going to be improved defensively. Again, I, I don't have a great handle on, on whether Colorado State's very good or mm-hmm. not. I, mean, I, I watched week one when Colorado State played Hawaii, and they were down at home 35-7 to going into the fourth quarter. Now, CSU made a nice comeback and played really well offensively in the fourth quarter, but uh, they seem to be having some issues in credit Colorado. They took advantage of that and put pressure on them and forced all those mistakes. So uh, I'll be anxious to see how good Colorado is on that side of the ball and have they really made that biggest stride from last year to this year. Well, and one of the good news, and we talked last week about this schedule being front-loaded with a bunch of home games, and the good news is you lose that game last week at least. Back in week two, now you're back at home again for the home fans. That's huge, and it's Colorado. Yeah. And going back to the comment earlier, the fans are still fired up about this <laughs> thing. Even though the players may not have any clue about the history of this thing, to the fans, they should bring it again tomorrow with their energy and their enthusiasm, their desire to see this team play and to beat a longtime rival in Colorado. So all that, I think, is going to help Nebraska get fired up tomorrow. I, even though it's not a night game, where night games you tend to get a little bit more juiced up crowd a little bit, mm-hmm. 230, but it's Colorado and yeah. it's the opening game of the year. Those two factors, I think, should make Memorial Stadium uh, a pretty lively place tomorrow afternoon.